Let's use the density matrix to construct the block sphere visualization. In the previous video in the quantum mechanics playlist, we saw this representation in terms of rho, the density operator, which is also known as the density matrix. We wrote down a general qubit state as this ket, and then we found the bra version as well. We expressed the ket and the bra in terms of the computational basis. And we took these coefficients, alpha 0 and alpha 1, and we parameterized them in terms of angles. And these angles are going to be useful for constructing a visualization that is called the block sphere. And we're going to take an arbitrary quantum state and we're going to represent it as living in this sphere. And uh, this over here, uh, this is a global phase factor, which I noted does not have any physical significance. And we're going to see in this video why this global phase factor does not have any physical significance over here. So let's go ahead and write this row as a matrix. And the elements in this matrix are going to depend on theta and phi. These are important angles in our visualization. So there's going to be four terms in this matrix. And these are the elements of the matrix. And they actually correspond to these four terms, which we derived in the previous video. So the first term is going to come from the combination of this 0 and this 0 over here. So we're going to take the coefficient over here, and we're going to multiply it by this coefficient. And that's going to give us cosine squared of theta on 2. The global phase factor gets cancelled out because we have e to the i omega multiplied by its complex conjugate. So those two factors, they cancel each other out. And then we're just left with cosine squared of theta on 2. And that multiplies this ket bra 0, 0 term. That's the ket bra 0, 0 term. And that's what we're writing here. That's one of our diagonal elements. Now let's have a look at the other diagonal element, the 1, 1 term. That comes from multiplying this term with this term. So here we're going to get sine squared because there's two copies of sine. And this relative phase term is going to cancel out as well because we have a plus i and then a minus i over here. So we're going to have sine squared of theta on 2. Those are the diagonal terms. Now let's consider the off diagonal terms. And I'm going to write them in a different color so we can tell them apart very clearly. The off diagonal terms are these terms over here. And they come from the cross terms when we multiply this out. So let's consider this term multiplied by this term. That's the 0, 1 term. It's going to have a minus sign in this relative phase factor. And then it's going to have cosine theta on 2 times sine of theta on 2. We can use a trigonometric identity to combine this cosine and sine into a single sign. So that's going to come at the cost of adding an, an additional factor of 1 half. So we're going to have 1 half e to the minus i phi times sine theta. Notice that it's not theta on 2, it's sine theta. That's what happens when you use a trigonometric identity to collapse sine of theta on 2 times cosine of theta on 2 into, into this form over here. And what about this other uh, off-diagonal term? Well, that's going to be 1 half e to the plus i phi times sine of theta. So what is the difference between these two terms? Well, here we have a plus and here we have a minus. So the difference is the complex conjugate. So we're taking the complex conjugate when we move across the diagonal. So these are the diagonal terms. These are the off diagonal terms. Notice that every time we multiply a term from here with a term from here, the global phase factors cancel out. That is why the global phase factor has no physical significance. It doesn't affect the terms in this density matrix. So we're actually free to multiply this ket by any global phase factor. And we, we won't actually be able to tell the difference with an experiment. So that means this is actually just a convention. So we can set omega equal to 0, and we can ignore this term and ignore this term. And that's usually what is done. So this 
coefficient of the zero state is treated as purely real. It doesn't have to be. We could also add in uh, a phase factor, but that doesn't add any physical significance. This relative phase factor, however, does have a physical significance. You can see that it shows up in the cross terms. So here we have it on, on this term, and we also have it over here. Let's use another trigonometric identity. And let's use that trigonometric identity. I'm just going to pull out a factor of one half, and I'm going to use this trigonometric identity to expand this term over here. So e to the i phi, that can be written as the sum of cosine and sine. So let's write that over here. We're going to have uh, sine of theta, and then we're going to have cosine of phi plus i sine of phi. So this is the same as this complex exponential over here, and I've factored out the one half. Now, in for the diagonal term over here, I'm going to use a trigonometric identity. I'm going to write that as one plus the cosine of theta. And there's also a factor of one half which gets pulled out. So this is equivalent to this term over here. Notice that when I'm using these trigonometric identities, this factor of one half within the trigonometric function, that gets lost. And it comes at the cost of a factor of a half outside. And you can actually verify all of these trigonometric identities by writing the trigonometric functions in terms of complex exponentials. So sine and cosine can both be expressed in terms of complex exponentials. And then it's easier to deal with those complex exponentials, and you can use that to prove all of these trigonometric identities. Now let's do uh, the remaining terms. So we're going to have sine of theta times cosine of phi minus i times sine of phi. So this minus sine over here comes from this minus sine up here. That's what happens when you take the complex conjugate. A minus sign in this exponent corresponds to a minus sign as the coefficient of the imaginary unit i. And what about this sine squared term? There's an analogous trigonometric identity which has a minus sign. So we're going to have 1 minus cosine of theta. So here we have a plus and here we have a minus. That's the difference between cos squared and sine squared. And notice that all four of these terms have a factor of one half, which we've factored out on the left hand side over here. And I'll close this matrix now. Now, we have a lot of trigonometric functions. So let's simplify this by writing it in a more condensed form. So let's write this as one half of one plus z x plus i y x minus i y and then we're going to have one minus z over here. So what is going on? All I've done is relabeled these trigonometric functions as x, y, and z. And there's a reason I'm calling them x, y, and z. It's because these quantities are going to be the coordinates in our visualization. So they're actually going to be three-dimensional coordinates, and each of these states are going to correspond to a three-dimensional point on this block sphere. So this z is the same as cosine of theta. You can see it appearing here and here. That's the z. The x is the same as sine theta times cosine of phi. And what about y? y is the same as sine theta times sine of phi. So this is actually a parameterization for spherical coordinates. And when we put it in this form, we can clearly see what's going on. We can decompose this in terms of the Pauli matrices. So let's do that over here. We can write this as one half times the identity matrix. So that's just diagonal. It has ones on the diagonal, zeros in the off diagonal. You can read that off over here. We have one and one on the diagonal. Then we have x times the Pauli x matrix. That's on the off diagonal. So that's where the x occurs. And then we have y multiplying the Pauli y matrix. So we have y times the Pauli y matrix. So the Pauli x and the Pauli y matrices, they are off diagonal matrices. But the diagonal matrix over here consists of the, uh, the, the diagonal portion of this matrix consists of the identity matrix and Pauli z. We can see Pauli z over here implicitly. So that's z. And we have 1 and minus 1 on the diagonal. 
and we'll close this off over here. So what do we have? We have four matrices. One of these matrices is the identity matrix, and the remaining three are the traceless Pauli matrices. Why are they called the traceless Pauli matrices? Well, it's because their trace is equal to zero. Here we have zeros and zeros on the diagonal, and over here we have one minus one, which evaluates to zero. So these guys all have a trace of zero, but the identity matrix has a trace of two. So that's why it is special. It is not like the other three Pauli matrices. But we need all four of these matrices to construct this row over here. We can write this in a more compact way. We can actually write this as a dot product between two vectors. So I'm going to do that underneath. We're going to write rho as one half times, I'll write capital I to represent the identity matrix. And this is the two by two identity matrix. This identity matrix is the same object that we used when we were constructing the uh, representation in the computational basis. So this operator plus this operator, that is equivalent to this matrix over here. This is the 0, 0 and the 1, 1 terms. So these two terms on the diagonal are the 0, 0 and the 1, 1 terms. That's the same as this term and this term over here. The coefficients are both 1s. So that is what this capital I means. Now, let's condense all of these guys as a dot product. So we can write that as a vector denoted by R, dot product with a vector denoted by sigma. So what is going on over here? This is a condensed form of these three matrices. So let's write that a little more clearly. Let's write this sigma out explicitly. So sigma, with this little arrow on top, is a vector, and the entries of this vector are sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. These are the traceless Pauli matrices. Sometimes they're also written as capital X, capital Y, and capital Z. What about this R over here? Well, R is a vector which lives in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. What is this notation telling us? Well, this fancy R is referring to the real numbers, and this superscript 3, that is referring to a three-dimensional Euclidean vector space. And the three-dimensional Euclidean vector space is equipped with an inner product, which we call the dot product. That is this dot product over here. So this is a three-dimensional vector, which we can represent as an arrow in 3D space. And what about this object over here? This is a little bit different. This is not the same type of object. This object has three entries, which are numerical values. But this object has matrices as its entries. So this is a two by two matrix with complex entries. That's what these objects are. So we're constructing this vector like object, which consists of three entries that are all two by two matrices with complex entries. So this is a different type of object to what we're dealing with over here. But it still makes sense to use this notation because we are taking the dot product. Let's write out this R vector more explicitly. So what does R consist of? The entries of R are X, Y, and Z. That's these parameters over here. And we can write these guys out as R times the sine of theta. And then we have the cosine of phi. That is the same as X. So that's what we have up here. We have sine theta, cosine phi. And then we have R times sine theta, sine phi. And finally, what is Z? Z is the same as R cosine theta. So you can see that R sine theta is present in both X and Y. And the thing that distinguishes X and Y is cosine phi and sine phi. And finally, Z is R cosine theta. Now, where is R up here? We don't see this scalar value R appearing anywhere in this matrix. Well, that's because R is equal to 1 in this matrix, because we're describing a pure state over here. But in general, the absolute value of this vector may not be equal to 1. So let's write out this absolute value. That's the same as R dot product with itself. So we're taking the dot product of this vector with itself. What is that equivalent to? That is the absolute value of R squared. 
And we can write that as r squared. So this r is just a scalar value that uh, quantifies the length of this three-dimensional vector. And this, if we, if we consider these three, these three entries over here, that is equivalent to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that is the absolute value of this vector. And these values over here, they can all be expressed in terms of the trigonometric functions. And if we were to write out this quantity squared plus this quantity squared plus this quantity squared, we would end up with r squared. Why is that the case? Well, we can use a trigonometric identity. Anytime you have sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle, that is equal to one. And we can identify a combination of sine over here and cosine of theta over here. And we can also identify cosine of phi and sine of phi. And when we square them, those guys are gonna disappear using that trigonometric identity. So for a pure state, we can say that this is equal to one. Or in other words, for a pure state, r is equal to one. But in general, this r may not be equal to one. It might be less than one. And in fact, it can go all the way to zero. And when r is equal to zero, we call that the maximally mixed state. And for all intermediate values, for r going from zero to one, but not including one, we call that a mixed state. And in the special case where r is equal to one, we call that a pure state. So what does this actually mean in our visualization on the block sphere? r equals one corresponds to the unit sphere. So you're one unit away from the center of, of this sphere. And all pure states are going to lie somewhere on that unit sphere. And all mixed states are going to lie within this unit sphere, within this block sphere. So we can think of this as a three-dimensional object that allows us to visualize the state of a qubit. If you're at the center, you're in, at the maximally mixed state. If you're anywhere within the block sphere, you are a mixed state. And if you're on the surface, then you're a pure state. You're like one of these states over here, which is a pure state. And all of these uh, matrices over here, these matrices, they describe a pure state which sits on the surface. In the next video, we'll see some examples of pure states that sit on the surface of the block sphere.